Hello and welcome to Blockchain Gaming World, episode 40. I'm your host, John Jordan. In this episode, I talked to Robbie Young, who is the CEO of Animoca Brands. Now, Animoca Brands, based out of Hong Kong, started out as a mobile game publisher and developer, but in 2018 pivoted to blockchain and since then has been one of the most aggressive companies in terms of raising money and acquiring companies working on blockchain projects, particularly blockchain games. So the reason I wanted to talk to Robbie at this point is they've just announced they've got a license for a, make a Formula One game called Formula One Delta Time. So Animoca Brands, as the name suggests, they've worked with a lot of brands over um, the years. So we talk quite a lot about how blockchain games are different to conventional games and how companies like Animoca Brands have to work and educate brand holders about the differences. We also talk about things like uh, true digital ownership of NFTs and why real world brands uh, can add value and sometimes subtract value as well in an interesting way as the Formula One game into what happens in the Formula One season. And more generally, we talk about uh, Animoca Brands' view of the blockchain game sector, how it makes deals, what's it, what it's looking for in terms of its acquisitions. Talk a little bit about their uh, forthcoming game at the end of the year, The Sandbox. And more generally talk about why Robbie is so bullish about the future of blockchain games. So it's a really interesting interview. If you have any comments, obviously you can find me on Twitter. I am Blockchain GMG. Great to get any comments on that. But um, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy the interview. Hello and uh, welcome to Blockchain Gaming World. Robbie, how are things in Hong Kong? Things are very good. Thank you. Good. Well, thanks for taking the time out. I know it's a bit later there than, than it is here in the UK. Um, so we've actually uh, known each other for quite a long time, um, starting off back in the days when everything was just uh, mobile games, um, and a bit <laughs> a bit less uh, um, complicated than, than potentially it is now. But um, a br- brief introduction. I mean, Animoca Brands, pretty well known. You work with a lot of branded products. So um, some I just picked off the top of my head, kind of Garfield, Thomas, Ben 10, Astro Boy, but loads of stuff you were doing in, in the mobile um, space. Correct. Um, really from 2018, um, from my point of view at least, uh, you start to get very heavily into blockchain very quickly. Um, might be good to kind of, um, I don't know if it's from a personal point of view or from a company point of view, um, how did that, that blockchain um, interest kind of come about? I, I think from our perspective, we couldn't help but observe you know, everything that was going on in blockchain, especially things, you know, the highlights from cryptocurrency on down. Um, and so I think as we observed what was going on in that, um, I think we were we noticed it with interest as a technological development, and then really once Ethereum was out there as a platform for developers to be able to do other things than create coins as a store of value, um, I think that's when we started to think about how it might be relevant to our universe. And frankly, when we got to know the guys at, at Dapper Labs or formerly Axiom Zen, um, who are the ones behind CryptoKitties, I think... It was, it was them who really turned us on to the full potential. Um, so we kind of dipped our toe in the water in blockchain gaming by forming a relationship, a publishing relationship with them. Um, so I think that's kind of how we got started. Um, that was sort of our, our gateway drug, uh, if you will, into uh, blockchain gaming. And uh, for you personally, um, were you kind of into crypto back in, back, in, back in the day or that kind of ICO kind of boom? Was that something that interested you um, kind of from a technical point of view? Or was it much more the kind of company? I think it, it it interested me from a technical point of view, mainly just because I'm you know I'm not a hardcore tech, technical person, um, but I'm an enthusiast definitely, and I, I'd say if a hobbyist would be the best way to describe it. Um, so definitely, I, I followed it with interest, and I think the whole idea of just you know creating a, a, a new decentralized internet, if you will, and and addressing concerns about security and things that seem so fundamental to what we do on the internet today. I think that really excited me. The main reason I, uh, we, I kind of wanted to kind of do this podcast now um, was last week you announced uh, an F1 branded game, F1 Delta Time. So uh, F1, how, how did that one come about and, and how easy is it to license uh, an F1 game so I think, um, you know, the road to NFT licensing, I think, is definitely a, lo- a long one. Um, as you mentioned earlier, one of the things that we pretty much specialize in is, is relationships with brand partners. So we've been making branded games um, for many years uh, on mobile and primarily free-to-play casual games. Um, so working with licensed partners is really an area of expertise for us. And as we started to think about making blockchain games, 
um, the idea of NFTs and creating collectible content that you can own, um, digital collectibles and, and digital own, true digital ownership, um, that really excited us because we could see how that might also appeal to some of the brand partners that we already work with. You know, um, as you mentioned, we work with Thomas and Friends, which is Mattel. Um, and so we thought, well, a toy company would really understand the idea of digital collectibles because they're essentially digital toys. Um, and they have all the properties of, of ownership and transferability that a toy has. Um, and so when it comes to F1, I think that was a genre of sport that we thought really lends itself to not only gaming, but um, the idea of um, digital ownership. Because I don't know about you, I'm personally a big car fan um, enthusiast. And so the idea of being able to you know, customize your vehicles and and um, kit them out the way you like, but then also the idea that that investment you make in that in that content is something that you can then share with other people or monetize or trade. I think that's that's highly exciting. So I've spoken to a few uh, blockchain game companies who are working with kind of uh, these kind of brands, and I can on one level I can understand that brands like things that um, you know make their brand kind of stand out and give them kind of cachet. The one thing that I w- was was less sure about is. Um, brands obviously like to be in control of that, and that obviously seems to be more of a cent- like a. I want I want people to spend money buying um, a Ferrari Formula One car, but I want it to sit on my centralized server. So I, if anything, you know, untoward happens, I can I can change it. So the interesting thing for me is um, is how brands uh, do they fully understand the fact that these things are you know once they're out there, they are immutable, and people are going to trade them amongst themselves. Um, and that kind of lack of control, which I think, you know, from my very limited understanding of brands is, is I can see that would be a philosophical, philosophically difficult thing for them, given kind of past kind of technology. Yes. And I, and I think for them, there are two hurdles to get over. There's the initial hurdle where uh, the idea of losing a measure of control over how the content is used. That's the first concern, because instantly they think, oh, are people going to copy it? You know, are they going to put it in YouTube videos where, um, you know, in ways that I wouldn't, that wouldn't represent my brand value. Uh, So from that perspective, we really try to impress upon them. This is no different than them selling a a physical item, a physical toy, for example, Um, and that you can't control the fact that somebody may, you know, uh, a kid may take their, their Starship Enterprise and use it to, to battle um, you know, Star Wars characters, and that's out of context, but that's, it's, they own the toy, they can do whatever they like with it in their environment. And that this is just a digital equivalent of that. Um, but I think the second hurdle, and, and actually, this is perhaps more difficult, is the idea of permanence. So often licensing relationships for content um, have a fixed term to them in terms of, you know, you're licensing this content for X number of years. But the idea that the items that we sell will then be owned, you know, for as long as we can imagine ownership to exist at this point in time um, in the virtual world. Um, That's something new for them. So the idea that they're going to sell this product to the consumer and the consumer will then have this product in cyberspace for, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, potentially. And how does the financial aspect of kind of resale come, uh, kind of play with them? Because, I mean, obviously, I assume you're doing the similar thing. We're kind of seeing now that, you know, with smart contracts, a developer will take a, a, a small cut of, of ongoing sales. So I think CryptoKitties is 3.75%. And obviously there's no reason that you couldn't make a smart contract, give a certain proportion of that, um, you know, cut to the to the brand. There's a very different thing of, of you know, selling something and getting 100% of it. Um, and then you think, well, if I if, if you can get secondary sales, then obviously I'm not going to sell so much of the the initial thing. So there's that, again, from a business perspective, I, I think, you know, how tricky is that um, to get across them? They, they, they could be making more money if there's loads of sales, but equally, it, if this thing isn't structured to have lots of kind of resale value, then actually they, you know, potentially just a few sales are not going to uh, be as lucrative. So I think that's, that's definitely a, a difficult conversation to have because it requires a change of mindset. Because, as you said, the traditional mindset from the content provider or, or the brand owner in this case is that 
you sell content if it's a one-way transaction and you know a sale is made and a commission is paid uh, whereas we think that the real potential of, of blockchain in games is that you're essentially creating a, a marketplace for content so that while you will have that initial sale um, that's not the end of the story and that perhaps creating a vibrant community where sales amongst the members of those communities trades or whatever you want to call it um, occur is actually you know the excitement um, and so i think that's the part of it that requires a lot of explanation <laughs> um so in terms of the formula one season uh we're two races in uh i think the game's coming out in the next month or so how how, how is that gonna uh, kind of play out do you think so from our from our perspective, that's not a concern because um, you know we're going to be covering the full range of content throughout the 2019 season, and so I think part of part of the collectability aspect of the content we create also has to do with um, what occurs during the season. So I think that hopefully fans are going to appreciate that you know um, uh, the results. That, that are generated over the over the season and who wins what races etc will uh, will affect you know the the perceived value of some of the items and things like that so we're, we're very excited about that because um, you know obviously we don't know what's going to happen this season um, but the game that we create will not only play during the season in a speculative fashion because people will speculate on who will win but after the fact as well, because obviously if you're going to be gaming, it would be great to play with um, characters that have had a success, had success in the season as well, um, because definitely there should be a little bit of a prestige factor there, I would think. So you've got this, um, fa- like, it's like, a, like a fantasy sport thing as well, where the, the real life events play into what's going on in the game. Definitely, definitely. And I think this is a natural part of introducing blockchain and the idea of collectability of NFTs into um, a gaming environment, because then, like traditional sort of freemium games, um, you have a game economy, um, and the game economy will then um, be governed by um, the collectability aspects and the, and what people are spending for the content in the games. And we should point out, you've got with the Formula One license comes all the official um, kind of cars and drivers and all that kind of stuff. So it is quite a powerful brand to have in in that respect uh what one kind of thing i guess that that we've kind of uh we're in uncharted territory for is is ongoing kind of season so um obviously uh you know sports seasons cycling in a year how, how have you thought about the long-term kind of um scenario where obviously some people have, will have bought i don't know if you're if you're kind of um portraying them as the, the I guess the, the 2019 Ferrari you know how does that play out buying that this year into next year's season because obviously that that has a kind of a quite a big impact in terms of how how um, how valuable these things can be and, and how how many times they'll be kind of uh, traded I, I think that's up to the that's up to the fans really I mean I think back to my own childhood in America collecting baseball cards which is I think something that at least back then every American kid did um, and when we collected baseball cards, you know, the, the rarity was one thing, but more importantly was when you had a, when you had a particular player that was on that year's winning team, um, and that affected the perceived value when you were trading cards with your friends. Um, I, I don't see any difference in this case that, you know, as you alluded to, for the teams or the, the, con- the constructors or the drivers <clears throat> who don't have a successful 2019 season, that will affect you know, the perceived value of, of digital content that bears their name. Um, but the flip side will be for the people who do do well, I think the, the reverse will be true as well. Um, obviously, there, there is a, uh, a, a broad kind of comparator in the market, um, talking about baseball cards. Um, there's obviously been uh, Lucid site. Uh, uh, MLB crypto baseball as it was uh, MLB champions as it is this year. So um, how much have you looked at what's gone on with that, with that kind of baseball collectible? Because it seems like the games are kind of broadly similar in the sense you, there's a collectible aspect and then there's it plays into the kind of the really what happens in, in the real sport as well. So have you looked very closely at what happens or do you think Formula One and baseball or maybe there are some differences as well? I think there are similarities to the extent that we're both trying to you know, we're both treading into uncharted territory when it comes to a, sort of a new future of gaming. So I think we're learning from each other. And 
in terms of building an audience, as we all know, blockchain gaming has a relatively small audience share relative to you know mobile gaming, console, and other forms of, of more entrenched gaming. Uh, and so I think what, what we have is um, an evolution of building the audience. And the target initially, of course, are going to be people who are super fans, you know, fans of the brands, fans of um, blockchain technology who may be uh, hold a lot of coins and tokens and have invested in in the technology and and enjoy using it, um, and so that's your sort of initial core target audience. But we hope that by leveraging such a well known brand as F1, um, we're going to bring in a lot of new entrants to blockchain who otherwise you know would not have would not have been interested in blockchain because of the fact that they're interested in Formula One, um, and we we hope that we can make the experience such that for them to, you know, onboard, as we say in the industry, um, will be relatively straightforward and will we'll lower as many of the barriers to entry to them just enjoying the experience and seeing how um, an entertainment experience that leverages blockchain can be just as fun plus, plus, plus than, you know, other types of experiences. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm guessing from, from the way you're talking about it is you're probably not onboarding with MetaMask um, as much as we love MetaMask. Um, what, what are your thoughts about uh, about just getting people to sign in and that, that whole thing about, you know, are they holding their own NFTs in their own wallet or, or is, it, is it better to have some sort of centralized system for some people? So the interesting thing about, about wallets and about token storage and things like that are I think these are extremely common problems um, or you know challenges across our industry, um, and frankly, there are a lot of really smart people working on solving these um, you know in parallel. So as we look at a rollout schedule that will go over the course of this year for the F1 game, for example, um, I actually would would lay money, and we are <laughs> by launching the game, um, that these problems are going to be continued to be solved and the solutions are going to get progressively better um, in a very short time frame because we've seen already i mean as you know blockchain gaming is barely a year or two old as an industry and we've already made such strides even though we have a relatively small um, audience share aside from formula one that's, that's not your 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 only kind of a game in this space so i guess uh the other big high profile one you've got going is uh, the sandbox which is um a, a, a bigger kind of project in, in every sense, not coming up to the end of the year. Um, what can you s- tell us about how, how that's progressing? Um, so it's progressing very well. Um, as you may know, the um, Voxel editor um, is out in the marketplace. Um, and that's the, the content creation tool that we've created. So for anybody who wants to create 3D content that will result in an NFT, they can use the Voxel creator. And we've launched a creators fund um, to help encourage um, creators in the community to develop for the platform. Um, one of the things that we really love about voxels for the user generated content market is that <clears throat> unlike you know the more professional tools like your your photoshops and illustrators and, and things like that, um, when it comes to what are essentially Lego style building blocks, I think everybody can be a creator, so it's very accessible, um, and it's really just a function of time that the more time you spend at it, the more elaborate your creation can be. Um, so I think it's it's very democratic in that way, and hopefully the ease of use of the Voxel Creator um, will encourage a lot of people to come and, and try it out and, and see what kind of cool stuff they can make. Um, if you go on to the Sandbox website, you can already see some of the examples of, of really cool stuff that people are, are creating already, even though it's kind of in a, in a bit of a beta mode at the moment. Cool. We'll, we'll put the links to that in the, in the podcast notes. Um, but as well as those two kind of big products, Animoca is being incredibly active in terms of kind of investing in things and kind of doing partnerships. And how, how are you kind of choosing kind of, kind of which uh, partnerships to make because obviously there's a lot of um, a lot of companies in the blockchain space some of which are a bit more um, kind of business oriented than others so I think from our perspective you know it's very early days in blockchain gaming even though blockchain itself may be more um, evolved 
And so I think one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're very openly saying to people, you know, potential partners that we are really kind of platform agnostic, if you will. Um, we're happy to work with everybody. Um, I think one of our goals for this year is to try to um, uh, filter through all of the potential ways that we can arrive at different solutions um, through literally various blockchains, various tool sets, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, to figure out what works best as a way that we can connect with our users. Um, I think it's all about bringing fun experiences to the fans of our games. Um, and because there is such a diversity of ways to reach them, I, don't, I think the jury is still out as to what is the most effective way. Um, so for now, we are actually, frankly, working with, uh, uh, as you said, a very wide range of partners um, because we think that there are benefits, you know, everybody has their benefits and their pockets of audience share that we can hopefully build upon. And more generally, obviously, you expect the market's going to do very well, which is why you're so heavily invested in it. But um, I guess we're not quite, uh, I guess we've caught the way through um, 2019 um how has it played out as you kind of thought i guess at the start of the year a lot of people were kind of thinking it's going to be a slow year um you know uh have you has what's happened in the last three months kind of changed your perception of how quickly um things could take off or is it still high levels of uncertainty i think i'm very frankly i'm quite bullish about it um i feel like that the momentum for um, blockchain gaming specifically continues to build um in spite of the fact that like I think last year we were all talking a lot more about the valuations of cryptocurrency and how that was a bit of a proxy for interest in blockchain gaming in general. Um, and I know that obviously at the beginning, at the sort of the dawn of blockchain gaming, um, because many blockchain games were built on Ethereum, often they were considered um, a bit of a proxy for Ethereum pricing. Um, but I think now we're getting to the point where we've a little bit outgrown that inextricable link from cryptocurrency valuations where I think people are starting to think of blockchain games, you know, which are essentially utility tokens um, as a real genuine standalone industry. And how do we bring together these, you know, two enormous worlds of gaming and blockchain because they are enormous in and of themselves. So it, it makes perfectly perfect sense that um, when you put them together, the audience and the the amount of potential revenue there for companies in the space should be quite substantial. And actually, on that point, um, as you talk to uh, people just in the game space, I think there still seems to be quite a lot of skepticism from what we might call traditional gaming or non-blockchain gaming um, about about blockchain. Um, do you feel there's a change of of sentiment, um, or is there still quite a lot of um, uh, yeah, uncertainty or quite a lot of uh, disregard for, for what's going on? I think there's always skepticism um, and it's not, you know, unhealthy skepticism. But frankly, I still know game companies who are who are skeptical about, you know, creating products on mobile because they're used to console experiences. Um, I think it just depends on what the vantage point you're coming from is. Um, you know, when we look at back at the evolution of, of mobile gaming, for example, um, I remember when I when I first joined Animoca Brands or the predecessor to it in 2012, um, that was the year that we really went, you know, all in on Android. And frankly, you know, my Western counterparts in, in North America and, and Europe at that point um, weren't even considering Android. Um, and to be fair, you know, processing payment on Android was was no piece of cake. I mean, it wasn't dissimilar to, as you said earlier, to making a MetaMask transaction. Um, but then look where it is now. So I, I think, you know, there's always reluctance at the beginning because I'd be the first one to say in, in blockchain gaming that the infrastructure is, is not there when you compare it to other types of platforms. It is definitely early days. Um, but we're hoping that getting in on the ground floor um, will enable us to participate, you know, in the whole industry as it grows. Um, and so that's, that's a bit of a bet we're taking. Great. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for your time. No problem. And uh, thanks for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to uh, subscribe um, through your uh, podcast platform. Always great to get uh, any comments you have. Um, you can find me on Twitter at BlockchainGMG. But thanks for listening to this one. And uh, come back next week and find out what's going on in the world of blockchain games.